I want to, I guess, just jump into attachment theory. And I love that it's taking off. I feel like a lot of the parenting books I'm reading are based off of attachment, a lot of the podcasts that I'm seeing. And I guess, why do you think that this is now the more popular theory when it comes to relationships and how we behave and um, like our mental framework that we experience the world through? I just think that there's so much in the relationship world that affects us, like our feelings and our wounds and our fears and what we're looking for. And I think that there's really not that much historically that provides a framework of how to better understand ourselves and other people. And what I often say about our attachment style is our attachment styles are subconscious set of rules that we've learned about love, like how we should give and receive love, what we should need from each other, what our expectations are, what we should fear. And so what often happens is when we have people with different attachment styles and they get into a relationship together. It's almost like you're trying to play a board game and you have a different set of rules for how the game goes. Like we sit down, Mm. we're going to play a board game. You have Scrabble. I have Monopoly. Like even if you want to have a good time, there's just going to be all this unnecessary friction because you have different rules for how the game is supposed to operate. And so when we have different rules for love and for connection, there's all of these pain points of, of confusion and, and poor communication. And so what I love about attachment styles and why I think it's trending so much is that suddenly we're in a situation where we're learning, oh, some of the things people are doing, A, are not so personal to me. It's because of their own needs or their own expectations. And B, when we understand that we give and receive love in different ways, we can start to understand what we're looking for and needing and what somebody else is, and then find powerful ways to overlap those two. And Mm -hmm. so I think it really provides this framework in a world that's kind of been missing a lot of that stuff historically, at least in a mainstream way that people can understand themselves better, understand each other better and bridge those gaps where there's challenges. So let's figure out, because I think the way that everyone talks about them is a little bit different. Everyone has their own definitions. And then I've seen different combinations of the attachment styles. So what are the main insecure attachment styles? And then how does that differ from a secure attachment style? Okay, great question. So the first, there's four attachment styles in total and three are insecure and one is the secure. So the secure attachment style grows up and they get a lot of what we call approach oriented behaviors in psychology. And, and it sounds like such a small thing, but has such a massive impact. So approach oriented behaviors basically mean that when you are seeing your child cry, for example, that child in their experience, they have a lot of consistency of being approached. The Mm -hmm. caregiver goes towards the child, tries to understand why they're crying, what's upsetting them. They are attuned to the child. They're present. And what the child then learns because of all of that is it's safe to express my emotions. I'm worthy of being heard. I'm loved even in my hard moments when I'm crying or having a tough time. I can trust other people. I can rely on other people. And they build a sense of self-confidence because they feel loved for just who they are in all sorts of moments. And so they grow up and they end up modeling those behaviors to other people as well. And our three insecure attachment styles basically get a whole lot of different things. So on one hand, we have our anxious attachment style. The anxious attachment style grows up in a household where there tends to be a lot of inconsistency. And they have what we call either real abandonment or perceived abandonment, meaning that an anxious attachment cell could have a parent like literally leave or pass away or, you know, there's a divorce and one parent leaves the home and doesn't come back. These types of situations. Right. Um, And that's a real abandonment for that child. But also the vast majority of anxiously attached adults had perceived abandonment as a child instead. And so perceived abandonment is like there's inconsistency. Maybe parents are both very loving, but they work all the time. So their love is there, love is taken away, love is there, love is taken away. And because the way that we actually get conditioned, the ways we adopt programs are through repetition and emotion, sometimes a lot of small T trauma, like feeling like love is taken away and it's just an uncomfortable experience. If it's repetitive enough, it has a very similar impact on a neuroplasticity and subconscious mind that big T trauma would. And so as an adult, this, this child grows up to feel terrified of being abandoned and they cope with that fear by trying to hang on really tight, call a lot, text a lot, cling to people or situations sometimes, even if they know it's not the right person for them. And so that's the anxious attachment style. They also tend to have a lot of wounds and sensitivities around things like not being good enough, being unloved, being disliked, rejected, excluded. Those are like their big triggering experiences. 
On the very flip side of the attachment continuum, in a sense, we have the dismissive avoidant. The dismissive avoidant grows up in a household where the overarching theme is childhood emotional neglect. Now, this, of course, can be very overt, like parents are literally never around. Maybe they're struggling with their own drug issues or challenges. Food's not on the table. Kids not in school. But that is the extreme minority of cases. The vast majority of cases is actually that we have dismissive avoidance who grow up and parents are have them in school on time that you know foods on the table everything's structured and normal but there's just no attunement to the emotions so mm. when a child expresses emotion they may be shamed for it like don't be a crybaby get it together come back when you're when you figured it out or emotions are deflect dismissed ignored shamed all of these different things and because of that the child grows up to basically go okay well you know, there must be something wrong with me that I can't get my needs met because we're actually wired for that attunement and that closeness. And as children, it makes us feel safe in the world to know that we have that. And when it's missing, it feels very uncomfortable. So Mm -hmm. this adult grows up and they say, okay, that part of me is wrong. And I'm going to keep that part really deeply tucked away. So anything that makes them feel too much they'll push away as a result. Examples could be too much closeness when the feelings get too real in relationships, when they have to be vulnerable or open up or when they're going through something personal and they have these big core wounds, just like the anxious attachment has theirs. The dismissive avoidance core wounds are I am defective or something's wrong with me. It's this big internal shame wound. They often feel unsafe in conflict and they'll really avoid conflict at all costs. And they also have big wounds of feeling weak if they're vulnerable or, or, you know, diminished in some sort of way if they're vulnerable and they often feel not capable of really connecting and figuring out how to do relationships in a, in a reciprocal manner. And so they cope by keeping people at arm's length. And when people get too close, they push away or they jet or they leave all of a sudden. And so, you know, interestingly enough, anxious and dismissives often get together in relationships and it becomes <laughs> this like really challenging situation. So the very last attachment style is disorganized or fearful avoidant. They're the same thing, often referred to as two different things. So um, the fearful avoidant attachment style grows up with the overarching theme being extreme chaos. Okay. It can be things like, um, seeing a really bad divorce and the children are really put in the middle, you know, mom's saying negative things about dad, dad saying terrible things about mom, etc. It can be extreme fighting in the home, you know, where there can be abuse in different forms. It can also be having a parent who's an alcoholic or an addict. And because of the chaos, the major theme becomes the child is like, I never know what I'm going to get. If you look at the example of an alcoholic parent, let's pretend it's the mother, Maybe one day, you know, child comes home from school, mom's drinking, she's in a great mood, she's extra loving and nice. And so sometimes connection is good. Another day, mom's drank way too much and she's cruel and she's critical and she's mean or she's passed out and that's unsafe and scary. And so on those days, connection is a scary thing. So the disorganized or fearful avoidant attachment cell grows up to have extreme polarizing ideas about connection. They want it so much. They've had really loving experiences, really good ones but also they've had really scary ones, really uncomfortable ones. So this person grows up as, as an adult to be like, come get close, come get close. Somebody's close or like, get back, stay away. And so they're constantly swinging and flip-flopping between their anxious side and their avoidant side. And they really share in both polarities of the attachment continuum. And part of it's because they've, they've experienced such polarizing ideas about what love and connection is. It's a beautiful thing and it's a terrifying thing all at the same time. Uh, so can you, can you be a combination of all of the insecure attachments or do you tend to be in one bucket? Yeah, you're in one bucket generally. I mean, you can have like a side where you lean, like you can be fearful avoidant that spends more time in your anxious side or fearful avoidant that spends more time in your dismissive side. But if somebody's like, I really relate to a combination, they're probably just the fearful avoidant one. <laughs> 